I've been saved through faith And it's not from ourselves It is the gift of God Not by our works so that no one can boast We are called to be free But we do not use our freedom To live for sin And so we serve and love each other Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Thank you. All right. Well, before I begin, I want to thank you, Rob and Tara, for allowing me to speak tonight. This is something I've wanted to do for a, for a very long time. And uh, I feel very blessed to be here. And. Uh, it's kind of fun to use that word now that I'm saved and I know what blessed really means. And uh, now as I start this, it's, it's a tough thing to talk about. Uh, my, my experiences growing up, the things that I've been um, involved in, and basically all the lies, but um, my, my main objective is to expose this, not, not to have anyone feel like sorrow or pity for me, but I really want to get to the core of why this is, why this is so evil, what, what Joseph Smith brought to this earth, and what, what Satan did through that man. And hopefully somebody will know through the Holy Spirit that how, how wrong it is and that they will be saved. There's nothing I want more than to have people leave that and know how false it is and find, find their true Savior, Jesus Christ. So uh, I'll begin with when I was younger. Um, First thing, I'm not sure why, but this came to my mind first. Uh, when I was, I don't know, my younger years, my mom got sick. She died from cancer. And she was what, what people in Mormonism call inactive. And she married my dad in one of the uh, Masonic or Mormon temples. And so, uh, that's something that kind of affected me throughout my life, and I'll get into that uh, later. And my dad remarried um, a lady named June, my stepmom, uh, soon after that. And um, so she, she's very much the opposite of my mom. I don't remember my mom very much, but she was a very loving, warm person. And uh, June was very different. And I didn't get along very well with her. Couldn't understand why I didn't have the relationship that my sisters had. And now, let me see, we moved when, uh, let's see, when I think I just turned seven, we moved um, to another state. I, w I was actually born here in Utah, but we moved to New Hampshire after a year or two. Now, when I was eight, my, my brother lived with us. And when I was eight, he, he was tending us uh, for several nights when my, uh, my dad and June left, you know, to go on their date or whatever they were doing. And I basically, I went downstairs to do something. Well, he told me, he told me about sex and I, you know, I'd heard about it. He had told me about different things like pornography. I didn't really know what it was. I, I was very ignorant. And he told me that it was all right, that he wanted to do that with me. And not knowing what it was, I went along with it. And also I was concerned, I was kind of scared because at that age, he, he was a very violent person. You know, he'd, he'd gotten angry and thrown things at me and my sisters, so I thought, all right, 
I'll just do it. I, I know that when it happened, it didn't hurt me. And that went on for, actually, I don't remember how long. So uh, sometime later, my dad and June found out about it. And the thing I couldn't understand was they told me, well, she told me I should have said no to him. And my dad actually told me he didn't want me to tell anyone that it happened. And that didn't make any sense to me. I talked to a girl at school, actually, about it. And she was, it's funny because for some reason this came to my mind uh, a few months ago. But she, she told me, she ended up telling me that her uncle, I believe, had molested her and her sister. And I don't know if she actually told me that she had told her parents or whatever happened. But I actually, <clears throat> when nobody, when, when my dad and, my, and uh, June wouldn't listen to me, and everyone blamed me, the school counselor and our principal both told me that they had uh, contacted her uncle. And I don't know if they arrested him or what happened exactly, but I know something was resolved. And it was very difficult because my dad approached me right after I heard about it. And he, he, he asked me, did you say something to her? And I said, well, yes, I did. And he, he couldn't even look at me. He says, well, Jeanette, we don't want you telling people about this. And I thought, something wasn't right. And every bishop that I talked to as well, I guess they were telling my bishops that uh, what had happened because they would bring it up and they would tell me, well, you're forgiven, don't worry. Hmm. And I thought, even at that age, I thought, I'm, I'm forgiven? What am I forgiven for? Hmm. And so, basically, I, I always felt close to God and I wanted to pray alone they wouldn't let me pray alone. They told me every time to ask for forgiveness. Um, at that age, I believed I was a dirty, awful person. You know, for 15 years, actually, I had that in, in my mind. And the really bad thing was I, I was told that no man would want to be with me because of what happened. And this never made any sense because I do remember reading the Bible. And in Matthew 18, chapter 18, verse 6, it says, But whoso shall offend these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And actually, that scripture, I'm very <laughs> glad that Jesus recorded these things. I'm glad that he had prophets and um, his apostles recording these things because without them I and I'm glad that I was able to read some kind of Bible because they have their translated version but I read that and it got me questioning a lot in that cult and two of my friends reminded me of that they said well why on earth are you condemning yourself for this and one of my friends told me you know what incest is not a sin you didn't do anything wrong but Needless to say, I had many forgiveness issues and many trust issues. And growing up, I, the doctrine always seemed wrong. There was always something off. You know, why, why aren't we allowed to do certain things? Um, why do you tell me not to question it? It just wasn't adding up. And the crazy thing is Satan had such a grip on me that I continued to believe that I was an awful person, I didn't deserve God's love, uh, somebody that I wanted to believe in and please, and uh, <clears throat> and I deserved that, or sorry, I believe I deserved that, you know, the abuse and accusations as well. I mean, I thought if, well, if my bishops are telling me this, then there must be something to it. So I really wanted to be forgiven. I wanted to be loved by God, and so with all this confusion and 
you know, being lost in this cult, I, I served a Mormon mission. And, uh, and I always wanted to serve God, or, who, you know, what I knew about God. And some people laugh because anyone who knows my story, they say, oh, so you wanted to serve Joseph Smith. And I say, yeah, all right, I don't know. So um, when I got there, I, I, went, I went to Australia in 1999. And when I got there, I was, uh, I actually told a couple people about what happened because it really was, as you can tell, it was a huge issue in my life. And I was actually told by some people there that baptisms would eventually help me be completely forgiven for this. And uh, my mission president and some of... Uh, baptisms, those, plural? What, what mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, that they always tell you if you, um, if you baptize one person, it's wonderful. It's uh, something in okay. their, their books. You know how great your joy will be, but if you bring many people, I see. Okay. Yeah, and that's just a general thing for for Mormon missionaries. But in my case, since I had sinned and been such an awful person, that you know that that would help me get to the celestial kingdom. <laughs> wow. And uh, and I was actually told by my mission president and some people that I served with there that. I have scoliosis, you know, it's a spine problem. Yeah, yeah because I was less righteous in the pre existence. Mm -hmm. So I need to be forgiven for, for incest. And uh, according to them, I have this problem because I wasn't as righteous as them. Yeah, it didn't make sense. And I was threatened with the Holy Ghost. I no longer call it that, I call, call him the Holy Spirit. I'm glad that's in the Bible. And so there were numerous doubts in my mind and... How did they threaten you with Holy Ghost? A lot of it was June, she'd tell me. Um, it, was, it was, I'm trying to even remember how it happened. She would tell me that the reason things were so bad in my life was because, you know, the Holy Ghost was telling me something or uh, or the Holy kind of Ghost left you, time. maybe? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know how they say in the meeting, oh, don't lose the spirit, or we need mm -hmm. the Holy Ghost here, that kind of thing. Yeah, she used that against me a lot, and, um, and also with the CTR ring. <laughs> it was just really messed up. What, that uh, she had to wear it all the time? Yeah, like I, I'd have it on my finger and she'd say, that does not say CTW, you know, choose the wrong. And, um, and of course, if, if, you were, if you were doing something wrong in their eyes and you couldn't take the sacrament, and, you know, I, I told you some things, Rob, about, uh, about some things she accused me of, because I guess she figured if I was capable of, of agreeing to um, um, having sex with my brother, that I would be doing other things much more disgusting. Mm -hmm. So I had all that in my mind, and there are just so many doubts. It's the kind of thing where I've told people, you know, we'd be here all night if I told you detailed everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have a question, by all means, I'll tell you. Um, now another thing was when I was on my mission, my mission president discouraged me from talking about the Bible too much. <laughs> you know, he <it's> <laughs> told me change the discussions, get people baptized. You're not here to talk about the Bible. You're here to talk talk about the Master and talk about the first vision. You need to get them baptized. You know, we're competing with the other missions, and I thought, what's this all about? I didn't come here for this. You mean other LDS missions or are you talking about the Oh other? yeah, other LDS missions. So it's just an inter-competition? Uh-huh, yeah. They'd get up and say about how many people they were baptizing and, and, and you know, doing and all the service. It was all an image thing. And I thought, well, what happened to just helping people or talking about God? 
I'm like, that's, I said, that's what I'm doing, I don't understand. They threatened to send me home early because I wasn't getting baptisms, uh, I wasn't obeying the elders, you know, the male missionaries. Yeah, there was a lot of rumors going around. It was it was really corrupt. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, um, I, I could detail everything and I'd be happy to answer anything for you. Um, now, before I get to when God saved me, I was very conflicted with the temple rituals, as I call them, you know, the ceremonies. Uh, it didn't make sense for like in my mind it didn't make sense for my dad to be married to two women because he was sealed to my mom That's and right. June yeah. and I certainly did not want to be with June in the afterlife you know what I considered what you know the celestial kingdom if I even made it to the celestial kingdom <laughs> I was worthy enough mm -hmm. and this came into my head as well um, it's, let's see, Matthew 22, verse 30. It says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And so I thought, well, it doesn't matter if, it, no matter what you do in that building, it's not going to matter because that's not the way it is in heaven. And it doesn't say the celestial kingdom there. So I don't know where you're getting that from. It's just very, you know, with all this going on in my life and, um, you know, still wanting to know God, there was uh, there's a scripture that I considered. It's Romans 12, 3, and this is still my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures. It says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And so this this got me thinking about a lot of things. Um, I thought, well, I don't understand why why I was involved in Mormonism for so long, I mean, 29 years of my life, and yet I'm questioning these things. This doesn't seem right. And uh, I was telling, I was actually telling uh, my friend Joe about this, and he says, well, it's that measure of faith that God put in you. He knew that there was something more that, and especially when you're told do not question anything, just follow, just like they say every, what's it, well, twice a year during general conference. You don't question your leaders, you just follow blindly. Now, um, my big conflict, as I'm sure you can tell, is that I wanted, I actually wanted to forgive my brother. I really did. It was something just so, so deep in my mind and my heart. And I thought, you know, this is something that I just, you know, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And it wasn't because of how my family treated me or what Bishop said or anything like that. I just knew that that was something, you know, Jesus forgave us from what I knew at that time in my life. Like I said, it was all very confusing. Anyone who has lived that, you know, been in that cult understands what I'm talking about. And so everything that I was taught conflicted with the Bible and with what I knew about forgiveness. And so one day I just remember sitting in a meeting and just hanging over the seat. I couldn't even put my head up. And I just prayed, I'm like, you know, I said, Heavenly Father, I don't know what to do. I want to forgive him. I, I don't want this in my heart anymore. And I remember, <laughs> this is so incredible because the thing I remember saying most was, I know Jesus, this is why Jesus died for me, but I don't know how to do this. You know, I just broke down. Well, a few months later, and I, I, I continued to go to their church. A few months later, I, I started working. I started a new job, and I met my friend Trey here, and I, uh, I was attracted to him physically, <laughs> but 
I knew at that time something was just, you know, I, I didn't know what it was, <laughs> but, you know, the Holy Spirit saying, you know, telling me, you need to get to know him, you need to meet him, talk to him, and I, I don't know, at the time I actually thought that maybe I was supposed to get him in Mormonism, so I, I asked him out, and I, I asked him if he wanted to go out with me Saturday night, and he says, well, I'm going to church, but you can come, you know, he was excited. So I went with him and walked into the Rock Church you know, downtown, and I thought, I'm looking around, and I thought, hmm, people here are praising God. <laughs> <laughs> and they're standing up, they're saying, That's praise right. Jesus. That's right. they're, they're clapping, <laughs> they're singing. <laughs> yeah. I thought, they're, they're cheering. I thought, it's not like a funeral service. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I sat there, and, and he looked at me like, yeah, this is, this is kind of strange for you. He'd been going for some time. I don't remember how long. And so I go, and, well, he, he didn't want a relationship like that with me, which I was all right with. But I asked him, <laughs> can, I, can I keep going to your church? He says, oh, yeah, you can go to the Rock Church. That's fine. And, you know, he, he'd sit with me, and I just noticed everything was very different there. And so I basically, I'd go there Saturday night, and then Sunday morning, I would go to the Mormon church. And I was in, uh, I actually served in the primary, and <laughs> I remember walking into, uh, you know, when they all gather together for, I don't know what they call it anymore, sharing time or whatever. And I remember sitting there talking to the kids and getting them excited about Jesus and everything. And, and I look up and the other ladies in there were standing like statues, nearly glaring at me. Like, don't, don't get them excited. You have to be reverent. And they'd stand up and say, excuse me, you know, at the microphone, we need to be reverent, do this. I thought, <laughs> the night before, you know, we're celebrating God, <laughs> and the children are running around excited. I mean, they were they weren't like crazy, but it was just a different atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, it was. I don't remember exactly when. In 2007, sometime at the beginning of the year, I, I go into to the Rock Church, and I'm sitting. Um, kind of towards the back. They have the screens, the, uh, what do you call them, uh, projectors, or you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> they have them all around the room. And uh, the one of the pastors there, Bill Young, he's talking about forgiveness. And I thought, uh, <laughs> I kind of I kind of put that out of my mind about my brother. I, I don't know, somehow I thought I'd resolved it you know, in the past. And I don't even remember what he said, but it was like every, every, everyone in the room had just disappeared. And, um, and I just remember hearing him say something. I wish I could remember what it was, but he just explained what forgiveness is. And I remember that moment God told me, you know what, this is why, this is why you're here. It's like, you need to remember this. And this is why I tell people, you know what, if you pray for something, sometimes the answer is no, but if it feels like it's taking a long time, and, you know, everyone's heard this a million times, but when I, when I asked God to help me forgive him, this was months later, and I had no idea that it would be answered this way. All I said was, I need to forgive him. I figured I was in the right place religiously, even with all the garbage that happened to me. And so, uh, was it two days later, I think? That was Saturday night, so yeah, two days later, I... Uh, I was just cleaning something in where I lived in the house. And um, and again, I was thinking about him. 
And then I had this thought go through my head. I'm like, oh, well, I don't know what to do about Kyle. You know, I don't know what to. And and I had this go through my head. Just write him a letter. And then, you know, he lives in the state. Would have gotten to him quickly. Anyway, I met with him and we sat there and talked. And I told him I forgave him. And he, he was just a wreck. You know, he said, I, I've wanted to talk to you for a long time. And, you know, he just said, I'll never be able to take that back, but I want you to know that there's nothing wrong with you. And I said, you know what, that's not what I've been told all my life. And I, I've told people this, it's difficult to explain, but when I hugged him and just, you know, we sorted it all out. I remember hearing something like cheering and it was like thousands of people were cheering. <laughs> and and I thought, so this is this is what it's like when someone's saved. This is what's you know this is what's going on in heaven. <laughs> so what was it a day or two, I think it was like the next day I walked into work. <laughs> I run in and I see my friend and and I think he had, he was just about to get off work and he said, I'm like, hi Trey. And he says, oh, hi. And I said, guess what, I forgave my brother. And he just looked at me like, oh, I'm happy for you. And I said, hey, uh, will you baptize me? And <laughs> he hadn't even been baptized yet. I said, and he, or he looks at me and says, um, well, I haven't been baptized, but I know someone who could talk to you and, and do that. And he says, do you realize you're not going to be a Mormon anymore? And I went, yeah, duh. <laughs> well, I get as far away from that as I can. It was, it was great, but yeah, he was really pleased. But uh, yeah, so, and I went to the Rock Church as well. Now this this is what Mormonism does to you. All right, I walked around to all these people that I barely knew and said, I want to be baptized, but uh, what do I do? They said, just tell someone. Yeah, you know, they just have to get the water ready. I said, no, well, no, I mean, what do I, and they said, looked at me like, what? What do, you, what do you mean, what do you have to do? I said, I'm used to this whole, like, grocery list of worthiness, mm. you know, all these works and everything, and, um, and they said, well, do you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And I said, yes. And they said, well, when do you want to do it? And I thought, well, it's not that simple. <laughs> <laughs> They look at me like, yeah, you came out of Mormonism, didn't you? <laughs> That's so funny. They all understood. So, yeah, I had my friend uh, who, she she told me once she wants to remain anonymous, so I won't say her name. But she, uh, you know, she talked with me about the true plan of salvation, the gospel. And, um, and on June 9th, 2007, I was baptized at the Rock Church, and pretty much the best night of my life. And uh, oh, and there was something as well. Uh, Bill's Bill Young's wife, Mary, uh, one night at a uh, it, was, it was some kind of meeting that the ladies had in the church, but they they were sitting there. She was talking about the uh, Passover in uh, Egypt with uh, the firstborn, you know, the destroying angel. And she says, you know, what, it was all symbolic. What they did was take a lamb, blood of a lamb, and put it on the doorpost. So when the angel came through, it would only destroy those who did not have it on the, only the ones that had the blood on the doorposts were saved. And I thought, well, right, I've heard that, and she says, and this is something she pointed, she actually specified Mormonism and other religions, false religions, do not explain this because they, they do not believe in, in Jesus Christ. She says, the, the angel did not go into every house or building and ask them if they were worthy or ask them if they were doing all these things because that showed that they believed in, in God. They accepted that. And I thought, that's incredible. <laughs> and I told her that later. She was really happy that I, you know, were gotten. And I told her I'd been baptized and everything. 
And also, uh, you know, reading John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And uh, also, John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I read those, and suddenly I thought, why on earth did I not understand that before? You know, before now and it's like it, it's right there that's what you need to do and you know, if you if you want to get to heaven if you want eternal life with God it's right there why can't they see that and so the wonderful thing is I, you know, I felt so free I knew I was free I knew I was saved by grace but you know from from God and I was finally God's child and it was just incredible. And uh, now one thing, I was not prepared for this. Satan hated that. He knew he'd lost me. He knew that I had been imprisoned for 29 years. And he was going to do everything he could to put doubt in my mind. For a long time, I just... I, I did. There was a lot of things that happened. One, one huge thing was, all right, God, if you, if this was, if this was a huge lie, why did you keep me in Mormonism for 29 years? You know, that bothered me. I thought, you know, all I wanted to do was serve you. I just, you know, what? Why did you put this all in my in my life? Why, why did you have people telling me that I was guilty of that? Why did I believe I was dirty? I didn't deserve your love. And I really got, I, I kind of, you know, I, I lost, I don't know how to say it. I, I knew I was saved, but I lost a lot of faith for a long time. I just started kind of, I stopped reading the Bible. I, yeah, I'd already, I'd already read the Bible at that point. And I was going to Bible study, I was going to church, I was, doing everything, you know, that I had wanted to do for, for a very long time. I stopped all that. I stopped praying. And one day I, you know, one night I, I said, God, I don't know if I really believe in you anymore. I didn't know what was happening. And, uh, you know, of course the Holy Spirit said to me, well, you know what, you're just, you're in a lot of pain right now. He says, you do believe in God. And I said, well, then show me something. Show me wh why I've gone through all this. And I mean, I know it's not a walk in the park, but it makes some sense. Well, two days later, I go to Barnes and Noble. It was January twentieth of uh, see two thousand eleven, and I met my friend Joe Hobbs, and we talked. He's he's counseled me through a lot of things. He's told me, you know what, you need to talk to people who, who have been involved in that. The reason that that happened to you was because you needed experience. There's a lot of people who are lost in that, who want to leave it, who are scared, who are threatened the way you were. And, you know, God, God made you strong. I'm not being boastful here, just... Glory to God, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. He's given you that strength that even though you were threatened by June, she told you you're gonna move out. You know, she got very uh, a year or two ago. She looked at me and told me, you know what, this is true, and if you're not going to accept this, then you can leave, you can move out. She didn't say you're not part of the family, but she got very threatening. You know. Satan really worked through her, and uh, but Joe helped me realize that, and and he says, you know what, you should just rejoice that you were in it so long. You know, you've gone through the temple, you've you've had that abuse, you felt worthless, and it's it's all a lie, and we are actually we just finished writing a book, and we just need to publish it now, <laughs> but. Um, you know, I've been reading the Bible, and now the big thing here, I don't know how much time I've got. Let me know if we're 
if I need it. No, you have plenty of time. All right, yeah. all right. Well, the big thing is, um, I am really thankful for that. Me meeting Joe made me realize that it, it was tough, but it, it was such it was such a blessing. It was it was a gift. It's I no longer feel like I'm cursed. I no longer feel like God God dislikes me or you know I've wasted my life with that. It kind of turned everything around for me. And one thing was, well, like I told you, writing the book, I had those experiences, and I realized that if I had told my dad in June about what had happened to me, and they'd said, you know, that was wrong, if, the, if everyone had reacted differently, and they had said, yeah, um, if they had sympathized with me and tried to help me, I would still be involved in that. And instead, I started questioning things and I was so bothered by it. Because when I, when I prayed about forgiving my brother, it wasn't a, oh, okay, God, am I, am I even in the right religion? Is this even true? Like I said, I had doubts, but I was still all right with it. My whole thing was forgiving him. And I've learned so much about forgiveness that I'm going to talk about for a minute. But if, yeah, if things had been different, then I know I'd still be in Mormonism. And quite honestly, that scares me more than anything else. And so, you know, God really is incredible. He, if, if anyone wonders why they're in this situation that they're in, I mean, pray, ask God. I would never have known if he hadn't put that in me to pray about it. You know, he let it, he let it bother me so much that I, I reached out and just said, you know, something's not right. I, I have to know why. And uh, now one big thing, apart from forgiveness, one huge thing that God revealed to me recently is understanding the, the they call it, notorious burning in the bosom. I have talked to so many people who say, well, I know that this doesn't seem right about the church, and, you know, this, um, I've questioned this as well, and uh, all that happened in church history, but that was a long time ago, and I felt that burning in the bosom, and I thought, well, God, I don't get it, because honestly, back in 99, I prayed specifically, should I serve a mission? And I felt that, and I've told people this, and they look at me like they're amazed that I could leave it after I feel this. And I said, I don't understand this. And he says, you know, that's how deceptive the enemy is. He used Joseph Smith. All right, this is, this is what I understand about it, very powerful. And I know that the people in Mormonism will still, they'll still have an argument, but I, I went to their books. Nowhere in Moroni does it say that you'll have a burning in the bosom. It says, by the power of the Holy Ghost. I'll give them that. You go to the Doctrine and Covenants, it's section 9, and uh, that's pretty much the entire section. <laughs> but, um, it's, yeah, it's section 9, all over Cowdery, and this, I believe, was completely made up as well. But Oliver Cowdery was basically jealous that he couldn't translate these golden plates the way that Joseph Smith was doing it. And so he supposedly went and prayed about it, and God supposedly gave him this revelation about, well, pray, and if you feel this burning or whatever, then you know it's right. But if you have a stupor of thought, and so, and, and he, I don't believe he even ended up doing anything with the plates. And it doesn't really matter because it's all a load of garbage. <laughs> In the end, it's all a load of garbage. It doesn't matter if he had it or not. But they've actually, you know, Satan took that and was actually clever enough to say, see, if you take that, tell people, pray about the Book of Mormon, 
and the uh, the church, not God, but the church. And you're going to feel this burning in the bosom. It's a power of suggestion. Yeah. And so many people do not realize that. I've had people call and you know call pastors and say, well, I don't understand, I felt that. And they go, well, the feelings are deceptive. And they want to pick up the phone and call them and say, you know what, it has nothing to do with that. Read it. They're not even linked. There's no cross-reference there. You know, if I were to say to you guys, all right, um, I want you to pray about this book. And if your foot starts tingling, you know it's true. <laughs> you want it badly enough, your foot will tingle. Your foot will tingle. <laughs> I prom. I guarantee you that that's going to happen. <laughs> now, the other argument, of course, is, as I was saying earlier, some people pray and pray and pray. Nothing happens. They don't have this burning. And so they're told that they're not praying the right way or praying to the right God. I'm thinking, well, certainly not the God of the Bible. <laughs> but that that's that's very profound. And truthfully, I didn't even realize that until a few months ago. And praise God, I mean, <laughs> that's just, that's incredible to me. And that, that just shows how, how good, I don't want to say good, but how good Satan really is. Because he will take anything and twist God's words. It's very important, you know, it's, it's good to be aware of that. And so many other things, like I said, we'd be here all night. But so many other things just didn't add up. And like I said earlier about wearing the cross, you know, I wanted to wear that and yet I was forbidden to do it. And I thought, well, why? Because if, if you have, if Jesus Christ is in your name, then, or, you know, your title, why, aren't, why are you not wearing the, you know, what symbolizes what he did? It just a lot of things didn't add up for me. And uh, now another thing, this is probably the most important really, is forgiveness. You know, I, used to, I used to hear if you, if you don't forgive, or forgiveness is forgetting what happened. Really, it's, Joe explained it to me this way, he says, you know you have forgiven people when you have the memory but not the pain. And that, that's what I, uh, that's important to me. I, I had a lot of forgiveness issues even after I forgave my brother. Uh, for example, with June, she's someone who has, and, and I don't regret this at all, because like I said, it all, it all made sense throughout my life, what happened, what she'd say and do, and force me to go to church. You know, it was all part of God's plan for my life and my education there, my experience. But I, I had a lot of bad feelings towards her, and I went to her one day, and I just said, you know what, I want you to know I've forgiven you for everything that you've done. I've been very angry with you, but it's all right. You know, I'm over it now. And, and I didn't want to. I sat out in the car with my friend Joe, and I'm just crying. I'm like, I don't know what to say. He says, you know what, don't, don't overthink it. Just We prayed, and let's just go up to the door, don't don't give a big explanation. Just say, you know what? I want you to know I've forgiven you. And they actually uh, they actually had their condo for sale for months. It wouldn't sell. And I went to uh, I went to forgive her, and I did. And I taught. Sometime I talked to her about God, and she asked questions, and I know she wasn't sincere. But she argued with me about everything. But I took some time, and uh, what was it? A week or two later, she she calls and says, "Oh, the condo sold." And I thought, <laughs> that's incredible. I felt like Paul when he was talking about this thorn in his side. And and my my friend said, "You know what? That's a that's a big key. I don't know. I'm trying to convey this." Uh, he says, when you look at it, every, everything else kind of falls into place. You know, you're, you're not you're not bothered by what happened. You don't have that that ache in your heart. You know, you, you resolve that God God's showing things to your family because you've forgiven them. 
and it's nothing that you did. And now they actually, you know, they, they, she and my dad moved all the way to New Hampshire. I don't talk to her anymore and uh, just can't. She vexes my spirit. <laughs> But I actually went to a lot of people who I who I'd gotten angry with and who I was just frustrated with, and I just told them, you know what? I want you to know that I've forgiven you, and please forgive me for anything I've done. You know, it's it's important to me. And they they look at me and they say, you know, I don't know what happened. Maybe it's because you were baptized at that church or something. They said, but there's something different about you. And uh, and many of them are still involved in that. You know, like I said, they're they're not. I don't know how much they believe about Mormonism, but they're still involved. But they, I, I see a lot of doubt. I hear a lot of doubt when they talk to me, and I just keep telling them, you know. And even with my spine, they say, I don't understand how you do that. I mean, you're you're always in pain, and yet you still pray and you still read the Bible and I say, you know what, it's, it's God's grace. And uh, and they say, I don't know how you can talk to Kyle and I don't know how you can do this and then I said, well, it's not me, I just know that yeah. everything happens for a reason. And I've told them the different uh, lies and the just how how false Mormonism is. And they look at me like, well, I want to I wanna listen to you, but you know, the, the, everyone, I believe everyone has that kind of that threat. They think, well, if I leave it, then people are going to stop talking to me or I'm going to lose my job. They have that fear. And it's very sad. And they just say, you know what, God's going to take care of you. I don't know how. But He doesn't want you involved with someone who took other men's wives and you know, corrupted the Bible and wrote, added to it, as we're told not to in the Bible and do all this and then say it's from God. He doesn't want you involved in that. That's wrong. And so, like I said, now I look at it like this is, you know, it's, it's a gift. It's something I, if someone walked up to me and said, you know what, you can live your life completely differently, take all that away and just, I, I wouldn't do it. I never understood that about people before. I mean, you look at, I uh, just wanted to point this out, you look at J.C. Dugar, that girl who was abducted and, yeah. you know, was treated as a sex slave and all that, and she says, you know what, this happened to me for a reason and I want people to know, you know, she, she's done a lot with that. She says, I wouldn't trade that for anything. She says, I wouldn't live any differently. And that's the way I feel. I mean, praise God. I've, I've seen it and I've lived it and I know how dark it is. When someone tells you, go through, go through this and do these rituals and pray this way, you know, you have to pray a certain way. And it's, and it's normal to feel overwhelmed when they tell you how you're going to feel. That's wrong. God will listen to you even if you don't say certain words. Mm. And he will help you with if it's forgiveness, no matter what no matter what your issue is. He's, he's going to help you.